Yes. Welcome to First Tuesdays. Um, we have been doing this program now for close to eight and a half years, where we present a different uh, topic of continuing education of interest to the librarians of Washington State. So um, my name is Carolyn Peterson, and I'm your facilitator from the Washington State Library today. And we always, and technical support is Jeremy Stroud and uh, Joe Olivar. And if you have any issues, um, they will be available to uh, help you get connect. As you can see, this is Jeremy's um, both phone and email. And Joe's is also um, probably going to be typing his in the chat window soon, just in case you have any issues. That Those are the folks to go to. And we always like to acknowledge our funding source. Um, the Washington State Library is a uh, division of the Office of the Secretary of State in Washington. And our funding comes from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So we like to acknowledge them. Without them, we wouldn't be able to put on these programs. So um, our Office of Financial Management uh, asks us to keep track whenever we do continuing education events of who, um, what your name is, and what library you represent. And if you are a student, just tell us what uh, school, I school you might be joining, joined with. So if you would right now just simply say, um, and then if you are from out of state, would you um, also indicate that? So we get, uh, really appreciate that. So if you could do that now, um, we'll get that typed in chat, and then Jeremy will collect that, and that will take care of our, um, our obligation to the Office of Financial Management. You know, we are currently here on the fourth floor of um, the State Library in um, Tumwater. And one of the things that's really cool is that we, are, we, are, we can see the flyway from here. And I just saw an eagle flapping its way by. <laughs> Bald eagle. It's on its way. Big, big, long wings. Either that or a heron, one way or the other. OK. Well, now, um, since everyone is, it looks like you're finished typing, we're going to get underway with our program. I'd like to introduce our two presenters. Uh, first, Philip Lees is the publisher of Readers to Eater Eaters, and his publishing house has a mission to promote food literacy to children and families. He co-founded the company based in Bellevue with his wife, Ju Lo Lee, as a pop-up bookstore in 2009 and launched its publishing program in 2012. Um, and then our second presenter is Jeff Kemp, and he is the Adult Services Coordinator for King County Library System. He's worked there since 2003. For the past four years, he's helped plan a sequence of year-long thematic adult program series on food, fitness, the mind, and current events and issues at the King County Library System. Previously, Jeff served as a reference librarian in a variety of public and academic settings. And he began his career at the University of North Texas, where he earned his uh, library degree in 1995. So with no further ado, we say thank you to these two gentlemen who were willing to um, repeat this program, which they originally did at the Washington Library Association. So if you would get started, we'll, I'll turn the mic over to you. Uh, so go ahead, the, the mic and the, uh, the forward button is all yours. Uh, thank you, Carolyn, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, uh, this is Philip Lee, and like Carolyn mentioned, so I'm the publisher and co-founder of Readers to Eaters. And just a little quick background about, you know, uh, more about who I am and what I do is that I've been a, a publisher for more than 20 years, a children's book publisher, and I originally co-started, co-founded this company called Lee and Low Books, based in New York, with a focus of pub publishing multicultural children's book literature. And you know, as a publisher, you know, I always felt like my job was to match the right child with the right book, and therefore we develop a reader. And then the longer I do this business, you know, in uh, you know publishing books for for publishing books for 20 years, and I, I I got more involved with advocacy work and really kind of learning about how to uh, you know start talking to you know education organizations, talking to the state level and the federal level, uh, trying to get more books into classrooms and even into libraries and so on. And very interestingly, very early on, people start telling me, well, it's not, you know, that the children in schools don't have, that we may have an achievement gap, but that the, the students don't have a learning problem. What we have is a public health problem in terms of access to good food. And if, if kids don't, especially in schools, if kids don't have a proper breakfast, you know, they lose attention by 10 o'clock in the morning and very little learning gets done after that. 
And that may be very, you know, very obvious to a lot of people in food, but even though, and here I am as a publisher doing this for all these years, and it was news to me. I mean, this was like back in about 2007, 2008, and I was really kind of didn't make that social connection to, to learning. And um, and so, and fortunately, right, that was like right at the time when, you know, Michael Pollan and all his best-selling books about food, On the Horse Dilemma, was hitting the best-selling list, the Obamas came into the office. So it really, there's a lot of conversation about food and the whole farm to school movement. So I got very involved with that. Um, and along the way, really kind of want to put my interest about education to connecting with food. And therefore, I started this company called Readers to Eaters. We started as a pop-up bookstore selling books about food. And then very quickly really realized that there's not enough books about food, especially for children. So you know, since I was a publisher before, I launched our own publishing program. And our first books came out in 2012. And and um, so now we consistently publish books about food. So that's really a history about, you know, uh, where we came from. And so I want to take us to the next slide, uh, which is what is food literacy? This is our really focus. Uh, so the mission at uh, Readers to Eaters is to promote food literacy. But what does food literacy mean? And actually, it means very different to, to uh, different things to a lot of uh, to, to different people. And very commonly, a lot of people refer food literacy actually to nutrition education, learning how to cook. But, um, we, uh, and that certainly is a, a, an important first step. But we want to take it to kind of go beyond that. And the first definition that we came across comes from Food Literacy Center based in California and Sacramento. And they talk about food literacy as understanding the impact of your food choices on your health, the environment, and our community. And because it's, it's a lot broader than just health and wellness when we talk about good food. It really impacts everything. And, um, and then with our own readers to eaters definition, we also kind of simplify. Our own take on it is knowing what as well as how we eat. You know, when you talk, about, talk to people in the food movement, there's a lot, about, a lot of discussion about know where your food comes from. So know what you eat. What you eat. But we also want to pay attention to the how part, the lifestyle part of, uh, the, uh, of, of our eating habits, to really the food culture. You know, when we look at you know, America today, where about 20% of our meals are eaten in the car, and more than 50% of our meals are eaten alone. So we can argue for good food, but we don't share a meal, we don't cook. You know, if we're always eating on the go, more about 60% of our lunches are eaten in front of the computer. You know, so, and I'm certainly personally guilty of that. And so, you know, if we don't pay attention to lifestyle, you know, the cultural part of eating, um, you know, then sometimes even putting the good food on the table may not be enough. So those are the definitions that we want, we want to have a uh, discussion on. And that takes us to the next slide, which is, why is food literacy important? Um, you know, literacy starts with the, you know, here we are in, in, in the education library world, and, you know, literacy is something that we talk often about, which is the basic knowledge of reading and writing. It's a, it's a foundation of communication. That is what literacy first. And I also think literacy isn't just about reading a good book. It's a, it can be as simple as reading a food label. You know, literacy is very fundamental to everything we know. Um, and so by gaining knowledge about our food ways, we can also make a better appreciation of what we eat, make better food choices, and make a positive impact on our body, our mind, our community, and the world. And that kind of ties back to the definition that we had before. And these definitions are really important. It seems very basic, but when we go out and talk to the public about what is organic, what is natural, what is a whole food, and even often discuss now about what is GMO and do we need to label GMO and not label GMO, but a lot of people don't know what that means. And, and, it, and sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a moving target because those definition changes. And so it's really important to have those discussions before we even know what is good food. It seems so basic, but in fact, you know, we need to have a better understanding of that. And another part that ties back to literacy is um, uh, food is a critical part to, again, developing literacy. So we came across an organization called the Family Dinner Project, which is an offshoot of the Harvard School of Education. And they come out with a study and, and tells us that um, 
you know, the, the part about rare words, children learn more words over the dinner conversation than reading picture books. You know, like usually they said, they, they learn about 140 rare words, kind of like things that's a little bit less common, you know, in reading picture books. But we learn about a thousand rare words at the dinner conversation, which really builds vocabulary and later reading skills. So those things are very critical. So we have this link here, and you can learn more about uh, the Harvard study. It's, it's very powerful, yet so basic. So in fact, what they encourage is like, you know, develop literacy by having family dinner together and sit and talk. Um, so uh, we really need a basic literacy to eat well. But interestingly, we need to eat together to build literacy. So that's really our philosophy. Um, and then along the way, when we recognize that how food and literacy interact, well, then it's a logical choice to lead to the libraries as a place to build this community food hub as connecting good reads and good eats. And here's you know, some you know, photos and some of the places we've experienced along the way. Seeing libraries are doing really exciting things already nationwide you know, in, in terms of becoming community food hubs. So on the top left corner is an event we held at the Berkeley Farmers Market, Berkeley, California Farmers Market, where we have an author read the Farmers Market, the Berkeley, uh, we have an author reads at the Farmers Market, and the Berkeley Public Library wrote their, their newly launched uh, Library on Wheels program to the Farmers Market with their Wi-Fi, sign up people on, on library card, but also display books that what the library carries as books on food. So that's a, a really wonderful program. Um, to the right of that, you see library farms. So more farms, as you all well know. Farms are now hosting uh, some community gardens. They actually host CSA programs and, of course, like some summer meal programs. These are all things that we'll actually discuss further uh, this morning. And then on the bottom left, this is a picture from the Philadelphia Culinary Literacy Center. And so at the Free Library, uh, of uh, Philadelphia, they invested into a big commercial kitchen where they call it the, the Culinary Liberty Center with the hope of not just teaching cooking skills, but also as a way to uh, uh, promote literacy in general. So they have programs for veterans, for, uh, very cultural activities, children's uh, activities for kids, and it's really uh, just a wonderful, comprehensive, ongoing program at the, the, uh, the Free Library. And then to the right is kickoff. It's one of our events here at King County Library. When that's that's me on that's me in that picture. In case you don't see my photo elsewhere, um, it, with uh, author Kim O'Donnell, who wrote a book about meatless, uh, the Meat Lovers Meatless Cookbook, presenting at the King County Library's Place at the Table program. So again, lots of very interesting things that's already taking place in libraries. In addition, you know, there's. Um, seed exchange, some of your programs that I, make, uh, that I talk about, that what more and more, as I travel across the country, I come across more libraries now really discovering uh, that, that the kitchen can be a maker space for creative ideas and community gathering. So really the goal, what I find, um, take us to the next slide, of uh, having uh, food events and food literacy events at the library is that it really builds a better community through food because food is such a great, a con a great connector and a great uniter. Obviously, we all do it. And, and so when we talk about food, you can do programming and discussion and community events not just around health and wellness, but you can also talk about food with, with, a, with, with the perspective of talk about history and culture and about jobs and transportation and sustainability that we find that over and over again, talk about food literacy, is a great way to reach out to the public and, and, and uh, promote community engagement. So with that, um, we'll talk more about some of the details. I want to pass the mic now to uh, Jeff and talk about some of the programs at King County Library. There we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, Jeff, you can click on your um, I want to talk um, there, uh, there a little bit about both why we chose food programming in the King County Library System and some of the hows, how we how we implemented it. Um, in uh, in 2013, it was the first uh, of our big uh, year-long thematic adult series, of, and we call it a place at the table. Um, we followed it up with. Uh, 
series on fitness, a series on uh, um, mind matters, dealing with brain health and the mind, and uh, we're doing a current issues series right now called Everyone's Talking About It. But A Place at the Table, in a lot of ways, was, was one of the most successful series that, that we've done. And uh, we, uh, we chose it as the first for a number of reasons. So, so why food programs? Um, the uh, first image you see up there may look a little bit familiar. And it is not the pyramid on the dollar bill. It is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, you may remember from psychology class back in college, at the base of the pyramid, our physiological needs, air, food, and water. Um, so food is one of the most basic needs that everyone has. Um, uh, as we kind of move up the pyramid, safety and security, self-esteem, um, self-actualization being at the top, and creativity, um, food kind of carries throughout, you know, all of our lives and, and in fact some of the more creative aspects of, of food and cooking and just being able to savor the taste of things are, are right up at the top. So uh, it is both a very basic need and um, it is a way that people can express themselves. Um, the um, uh, Another uh, uh, example, the, the uh, Asian Grandmother's cookbook um, is a great example of a cookbook that kind of ties into um, cultural awareness. So just as um, food uh, is a basic need for everyone, it's also expressed throughout many different cultures and it is a good way for us to connect with some of the diverse uh, communities in our area um, and, and have them share about uh, some of their food traditions. Um, th the other thing that we found really nice about food programs is the DIY aspect, and this is not just in, in cooking food, but also in growing food. Uh, some of the backyard chickens programs that we've done, we've had folks come in and show how to, how to keep chickens, and they've been really popular. Um, that idea of kind of uh, uh, urban farming, do-it-yourself aspect of cooking is something that's been very popular. Uh, another thing that we've kind of noticed over the last few years, and that you've probably seen in your library, is that cookbooks circulate. Information about cooking is really popular. Um, back in, um, it, in, in 2011, they surged kind of to the top of the top category at, at libraries. And uh, it's, it's held true. It's actually, if you look at uh, the numbers from last year's uh, library journal material survey, uh, top circulators in adult print books, uh, cooking, and then top circulation in adult e-books, uh, cooking was actually number two, surprisingly enough. And other types of things that can relate to cooking, like self-help types of books, if you look at nutrition as a topic and diet, uh, or how-to and home arts, those are also on some of those lists, and they intersect with, uh, with food in a lot of ways, too. So our series was um, uh, A Place at the Table. Uh, inspiring cooks, nourishing communities. And we really looked at ways that food and cooking uh, expressed throughout um, all areas of people's lives. As I mentioned, we had, we had programs not only on cooking food, but on growing food, on nutrition, and I'll talk about some of the partnerships and programs uh, uh, a little bit later. Uh, but I want to tell you a little bit about the planning process that we used for it. We had an adult program council uh, develop uh, the initial concept, and we had a lot of people at the table um, from different levels in our, in our system. So we had uh, managers, we had uh, uh, program coordinators like, like myself and, uh, and Deborah Schneider, my colleague. We had programming librarians from out in the libraries. We had represent representation from graphics and community relations. Um, so kind of a broad representation. We also had conducted an adult programming survey. Um, and that informed our decision to go with food because we I had identified, just as the, the uh, library journal statistics indicated, that information on cooking and DIY and craft type things were all very popular. 
Um, also, we got uh, response from our community libraries, the kind of things that they were interested in, um, uh, connecting with Philip at Readers to Eaters, and also uh, we worked uh, quite a bit with Skip Stone Press, uh, who are connected to uh, uh, Mountaineers books, but they have kind of a lifestyle imprint where they have a lot of information um, uh, that, that was really uh, connected, uh, things on uh, um, cold season gardening, uh, uh, preserving, those type of things that fit in really well. Uh, and also in, in planning for the, the um, authors that we brought in, one of the things that, that myself and, and, uh, and Deborah did was we attended the Tom Douglas Cookbook Social, which was in November in Seattle, and a lot of cookbook authors uh, came together at that event, and we were able to make some great initial connections. And that's an annual event. Uh, the partnerships that we developed were also very important. Uh, a place at the table uh, was something that was supported by the King County Library System Foundation with funding. But we also had um, some media partners with uh, public television, uh, public radio, uh, and also some uh, partners around like Food Lifeline and Hope Link that were involved in collecting food donations, which I'll talk about later. So the partners provided promotion. Uh, they were sources for programming in the case of, uh, for example, the Washington State Association of Nutritionists and Dietitians. Uh, they partnered with us and they actually came into the library to offer nutrition programs. Uh, and uh, they also, uh, in some cases, provided new venues at, uh, at Bastyr University. We had a great... Uh, a great event, and they were able to kind of host uh, uh, a preview with our foundation, and it kind of gave us another another venue in which to author uh, offer an author visit. So again, types of programming: gardening, cooking, backyard chickens, canning, and preserving has been extremely popular. And and if you look at uh, some of these, we've continued to offer uh, following up uh, in previous years, finding ways to kind of build those into uh, to future programs. Uh, other things like the couponing program that we did was actually something that was developed in, in uh, one of our community libraries where they had someone locally who was really into couponing and they were able to kind of share their experience. So people are more than willing to share and, uh, and it, it's, it's the kind of thing where when you have local cookbook authors or local chefs or local people with experience, uh, you can find great ways to, uh, a lot of times at pretty, pretty low cost or no cost in some cases, uh, offer some great programming. We also shared a lot of information through our um, online presence and our email newsletters. Our online promotion, we had a, a page on the site where we would highlight some of the uh, author visits and uh, and programs, uh, and, and this was something that, that we really felt was helpful for us to carve out a place on the website specifically for that series that we could share on social media, that we could just kind of have people um, go to throughout the year to find out what kind of programs were available. We also highlighted uh, local food bloggers. If you'll notice uh, over on the right-hand side of the page, a list of the local food bloggers was there with links to their blogs. This not only gave people an idea of what kind of uh, other food things were going on locally, but it, it helped us promote the series because those bloggers who in some case were presenting in the library could also share information about the series. We also did some live streaming through, um, uh, through Google, uh, and uh, that's something that we were able to promote online and in some cases uh, um, through our partners, but it, it was kind of a nice extra touch for people that couldn't attend a program live. Uh, they could watch a, uh, a stream on our YouTube channel after the event. We also tried to pull in a lot of variety of different kinds of programming. Uh, in, in all of our series, we try not to be too heavy on the lecture uh, format. So in addition to having people come talk about their books, we had a lot of hands-on experience for people to be able to try things out. 
And in the case of Bushwick Book Club, we had a musical element. Uh, the the uh, Bushwick Book Club of Seattle is a, a group of musicians that, that write music inspired by books that they read. So around whatever book is selected, they will have local songwriters and musicians uh, write music and perform it uh, in um, um, all around that uh, all around the book that's selected. And what we did is work with them to create a bunch of songs around Michael Pollan's books, The Omnivore's Dilemma, Botany of Desire. Um, and it was a great event. The, the uh, show at the Bellevue Library was actually recorded and, uh, and broadcast on KBCS, where we were able to get also promotion through public radio, which was really neat. So kind of to, to kind of wrap up what our experience was with that series, we had more than 4,400 patrons attending programs in the series, and 18% and were first-time attendees. And we felt that that was a really significant thing um, because one of the goals of the series was to bring people into the library that maybe hadn't attended programs in the library before, and we really felt that this one um, hit that note in, in – in probably a, a, to a greater extent than any of our other series have, really resonated with new folks. Um, and it also allowed us to create new partnerships with organizations like TCC Natural Markets, the Washington State Associate, Association of Nutritionists and Dietitians, and also connect with KCTS9. And one of the things that, that I want to mention with them is they, they had actually had a promotion where people were submitting recipes to be included in the KCTS9 cookbook. So we included information about their promotion on our website, and they included information about um, our series on the KCTS9 page. So it was really a win-win there. Before I ask, um, um, before I uh, continue on, we'll talk a little bit about our food donations. I did have a, a, a couple of questions. Now, on the um, uh, in the box above where it lists everyone who the who is in our in a room, there's a, a check mark that'll allow us to uh, survey you all with kind of uh, yes or no questions. How many of you have offered? some kind of a food program, either an author program or, or, or something related to food in, in your libraries before? You can find the green check for yes, red X for no. Uh, I pointed to it on the screen. Oh, that's great. And um, the, um, how many of you today are children's librarians, just to get a sense? Lots of no's. So I'm going to ask the other one, and I can predict, I think, what the results are going to be. How many of you work with, uh, work with adults? Mara's one of our coworkers. Apparently, she doesn't work with adults. <laughs> now that gives me a great sense. Um, as Philip was saying, this is these kinds of food programs are something that are really successful, kind of across the lifespan. And if you look at, um, you know, everybody has experiences from food when from the from the moment they're born. And a lot of the programming opportunities that we'll have. Um, uh, I, I'm talking specifically about A Place at the Table, which was an adult series, but we've also had a lot of experience with uh, children's programming and all ages programming. We'll talk a little bit about that later, but I just kind of wanted to get a sense for who was in the room. Um, the food donation program was something that, that we instituted as part of A Place at the Table in order to give back to the community and to find a way to kind of engage with the community around um, a common goal. We had programs that were offered. We had 
had a variety of different things that people could come to in the library, but we wanted a chance for, uh, to make a chance for people to have a, make, really make an impact. In the food donation program, which we partnered with Hope Link and Food Lifeline to distribute food to more than 45 community food banks, people could drop off food at any of our libraries, and throughout the year, we collected a total of 30,808 pounds of food, equaling more than 20,538 meals, which are really exciting numbers. And one of the things I want to point out about food donation programs, and if you're working with local partners, a lot of people will donate food around the holidays, but the food banks have need throughout the year. So if you're thinking of something, you know, working with a food uh, bank or, or, or a donation program, uh, keep that in mind with, when you're working with them. Uh, it was great that we were able to maintain those donations kind of going, going all year, um, particularly given the fact that a lot of times they are just around the holidays uh, uh, in, in the experience of the people we worked with. Another thing that we have uh, started to do since a place at the table is uh, expand a summer meals program in the summer, um, working specifically with libraries in South King County uh, that meet certain criteria. We're working with United Way and Within Reach. Uh, the link to parenthealth123.org will kind of give information about the program, but just kind of as a snapshot, how we've kind of been able to continue this kind of idea of, of, uh, of uh, this food community service. In 2014, we helped 710 children and teens served at two sites. Last year, 2009, uh, 694 children and teens at four sites. And uh, this year in 2016, we anticipate adding three more sites. So we've had a lot of growth. One of the other trends that, uh, that we're seeing is uh, seed libraries, and we're actually doing um, uh, going to be starting one in, at the Widmot Library, which I'll talk about, um, uh, in conjunction with their community garden. Uh, you've probably seen a lot of information in the news about seed libraries. Um, their links that I've provided on the screen kind of give you some good background with an American Libraries article and a good survey from the um, Nebraska uh, uh, in the second link. At seedmatters.org, if you have questions about like what are some of the legal requirements, what, what's going on, uh, I found that that site gives a lot of good information about what is currently happening. Yes, Oakland, California. Um, the uh, I just noticed in the chat box people are talking about the um, uh, the uh, photo from that seed uh, library example. Um, they're big in California, they're big across the country, and um, if you're interested in what our experience is, um, you know, feel free to contact me afterwards. We're working on, on just building it up now, but I just kind of wanted to say that, that that's probably something we received more questions about at our WLA presentation last year than, than anything else. So our Woodmont Garden uh, is where we're going to be hosting it, and it's an existing community garden where we work at, at the Woodmont Library. Uh, a lot of children's programs we host there, but again, it will be the site for our seed library. And uh, as um, Philip mentioned, the library farm is an ex another example out in New York of uh, that kind of library farm, community farm example. Uh, kitchens as maker space is something that um, we've really seen a lot of overlap with. Uh, how many people have offered some kind of a maker program in the library, either like dealing with uh, um, Arduino or maker kits or makey makey? We'll do a yes or no poll on that one. Because one of the things that I really think is a great opportunity, particularly because cooking is so hands-on, is to looking at cooking as a maker activity. Uh, Philip mentioned that the library kitchens 
are a big thing that's expanding. There are also community kitchens, like that potluck kitchen studio, studio in the Anacortes is uh, actually uh, not something from the library, but uh, a business that opened up in the community to to provide that cooking space. And they've actually recently moved to a larger location. As we look at the, um, just to kind of tie it back to books and libraries before Philip um, uh, talks about some other issues with kind of food literacy, there was a real opportunity for us to connect not just with local authors, as I mentioned before, but also some pretty high profile national folks who are on book tour. We don't usually have as, as good a luck as we did with this series, and I don't know if it had to do with food or if it just had to do with the planets aligning, but we were able to connect with Michael Moss on his book, Salt, Sugar, Fat. Um, part of the Plate, uh, Molly Katzen, uh, a great book about vegetarian cooking or plant-based diet. Uh, that was the program that we offered at Bastyr University, uh, and they hosted that um, as one of our partners at a great venue. Uh, and uh, the Pioneer Woman uh, was a, a, another great opportunity when she was on tour. We worked with her. So um, the books not just on cooking but also on diet, canning and preserving, uh, eco-thrifty, gluten-free, there are a lot of topics that are really big and that people are interested in we were able to connect with. And again, our, our local authors were an amazing resource as well. Um, the, um, in addition to some of the cook, cookbook authors I mentioned before, Cool Season Gardener, which is something that Bill Thorness, uh, a great book that, that he's written. He's also presented a lot in our libraries. Books on foraging, Jennifer Hahn uh, from up in the Bellingham area. So there's a great book on West Coast foraging that was extremely popular. Uh, we've had other presenters in the libraries talk about mushroom collecting, uh, different types of things like that. Any kind of activity that people can participate in is a great tie-in, and it gives people a more connection to where their food is coming from. And as we had all these authors come in, it was we also had a good opportunity to create book lists in our catalog. Uh, we still have the lists on food and culture. I mentioned that culture connection being really big. And on hunger is an issue in our communities. Um, we keep those book lists live on our, um, on our catalog. And again, with Readers to Eaters, uh, Philip Lee is all about books and publishing. So Philip, I, I'm gonna hand over to you and let you talk a little bit about uh, uh, about thank, what thank you, you do again and um, some of the so other now issues I want to, literacy. Uh, you heard about the Place at the Table and all the, all the great programming that they did. And, um, and I want to give you some ideas about what you can do maybe in your community, in your areas, and some upcoming events and dates. Um, and, and a bit of a, almost like a follow-up since uh, the Place at the Table. And, um, and, and one thing in particular I want to highlight um, is the Food Literacy Month. Uh, this is a Food Literacy Month is September, and last year we had Governor Jay Inslee of Washington State uh, officially proclaim September as Food Literacy Month in the state, and we're the second state to do so after California. California State Legislature first, you know, proclaimed uh, uh, Food Literacy Month in 2012, and it really is a great occasion to really promote. Uh, food education, and I want to highlight two passages. So that's the proclamation. You see part of it right there at the very top, which goes back to you know the, the early definition that I gave, which is whereas food literacy is defined as the understanding of the impact of food choices on health, community, and the environment. And then uh, this got cut off, but you, you'll probably uh, will we'll provide you see the very end, the very last uh, of this passage. It says, whereas the objective of Food Literacy Month is to promote food education, inspire food choices that are good for people and good for the planet, encourage parental involvement, and motivate community-wide support. So that's really the, 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 the focus and activities around Food Literacy Month. It's something that 
last year, Readers Eaters, you know, I'd say we kind of took the lead in terms of, of promoting this effort in Washington State, and we partnered with a lot of state agencies as a, as a, as a great uh, occasion to connect food and farm people as well as education and literacy people. So, you know, some of our uh, initial sponsors include the Washington Library Association, the Washington Library Media Association, uh, which is for schools, the Washington State Farmers Market Association, the Cascade Harvest Coalition, which is really the, the organization for farmers, the, the Washington Sustainable Food and Farm Network, you know, which represents the Washington Farm to School Movement, you know, and so, you know, it's really, uh, and we had a kickoff of event at the Seattle Public Library uh, at the auditorium where Trudy Ainsley, the governor's wife, came as our, as our kickoff speaker. And just to give you an idea how these events can be really meaningful, at this event, at our kickoff event, when Trudy Ainsley came and brought pro uh, vegetables from her own governor's uh, garden that she put in, and she's a great farm to school advocate for the state, um, it was the first time that the uh, the Washington, uh, excuse me, the Seattle Public School uh, uh, heads of the school uh, school garden program and the school library program, as well as the school nutrition program, which was the cafeteria, got to got to interact with each other for the first time. So, for example, at this function, the uh, the school nutrition director was saying that what well, they had this thing that in the state that uh, was called harvest of the month. So, like say for for the month of November, they show they they serve carrots. And the library director says, "Well, I bet you know it's been going on for years." And the library director didn't know about it and said that, um, "Well, we can we can serve. Oh, well, I bet we have 20 books about carrots in the library, and we can help co-promote these ideas." And so it's again, it's a wonderful occasion. Just put people together and just kind of connect and let everybody's creativity fly. And so that is something that we're really excited about, and we're going to relaunch this program again this, this September, and we're going through our planning now. And whatever community you're in, is said California is, is doing it. Now we're doing it, repeating it in Washington, and already, um, you know, I've had discussion in Texas and as well as Wisconsin who is interested in doing the same. So we hope that Food Literacy Month is really going to be an ongoing and growing national movement to, again, connect food people with education people. And um, so I hope your community, that's a good time to start. You know, here we are in April. And to even just having a, a small discussion with other, of whatever community you, you're you in to start connecting with, you know, the, the different groups and, and planning activities. And so um, at this event uh, at last year's, so we also included some children's book authors. Um, uh, Jeff had given examples of many of our local adult authors, and we're very fortunate to have a number of terrific uh, Pacific Northwest children's authors as well. So all these authors came to our event um, uh, to, to present books. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, their, their children's book on food, so it was, it was terrific. Um, and then, uh, you know, we want to give some examples of if you want to uh, develop programs and community partnerships about food in, in your community, you know, here are some good organizations to think about. Um, certainly the schools, the parks, um, and it's interesting, I want to start with those two organizations because oftentimes the schools and the parks are the largest landowner in a city. You know, and they have a lot of land to, to do things with. So that's why, so for example, in Seattle, Seattle Public Schools, I believe, is, uh, I'm sorry, in, in, in Seattle, the Seattle Parks is the largest landowner, but I think in Portland, Oregon, Seattle, uh, Portland Schools is the largest landowner in the, in the city. So they have, so they, they're already having these uh, ideas about how to develop that to go beyond just uh, their, their usual activity and connect into the, into the food movement. And at the farmer's market, for example, many, like here in King County, you know, some of the farmer's markets are actually hosted on weekends at the, at the library parking lots. And so that they, they are a great, uh, uh, 
community partners because they're already there working with the libraries. Um, Faith-based organizations, and um, we've actually had uh, tremendous success working with the Catholic charities in Washington State, spe and specifically in the Spokane area. Um, they've had a, a, a Food for All program that reaching out. They partner with the Spokane Farmers Market. They use, uh, you know, Farmers Markets now is trying to be. Uh, uh, they're, they're trying to in, make, make themselves more accessible to low-income families by accepting uh, EB, uh, EBT tickets, which is uh, the food stamps. And now with the SNAP program, um, they also have SNAP Ad, and so we work with them. They use a SNAP Ad as an education fund to buy books from Leaders to Eaters, and they give it away at the farmer's market to low-income families with the EBT tickets slipped inside, and it's been tremendously successful at bringing new families, new low-income families coming to farmers markets. And maybe that those are ways that uh, libraries can uh, look into exploring the same type of activities. You know, again, there's other youth organizations, you know, such as uh, the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or Boys and Girls Club. Uh, the food banks, um, uh, examples include the Northwest Harvest, the Food Lifeline, these are people that Jeff work with the King County Library for their programs. Um, hospitals are actually a really key part of now getting involved with the, with the food movement uh, in terms of, um, you know, in, in many ways hospital food get the same bad rap as school food and hospitals have been progressively improving what they offer to patients, but also to the hospital staff. And so, because basically they have a 24-7, you know, feeding schedule. I mean, the hospital doesn't stop. So, there, if you're in your community, so, you know, sometimes it's, it's a great way to, to bring hospital speakers to the libraries to talk to programs about how, what they do about uh, creating good food, you know, and, and similar to corporations. More and more corporations are thinking of ways to feed their employees better. And so, um, and so, uh, as you plan programs, uh, you may want to invite some of the, the corporations coming in, large and small. I mean, for example, there's an um, there's a company here that that where the the, the partners. Um, uh, Peter Miller with the bookstore, he cooks up, he's a, he's a small company with, with six people and he makes lunch for his employees every day. And so he's in, you know, we've done some programs with him where he talks about what, why it's important to, to even for small companies to think about feeding their employees. And again, arts and sports organization. And um, they, we feel that when we talk about, about good food, um, through arts and sports, especially with sports activity, it's a wonderful way for people to, to understand how food gives immediate results to their body, uh, not just in terms of, you know, so we don't always want to talk about, um, you know, eating, you know, unhealthy food gives you heart disease or diabetes in 20 years, but no, like for, especially for kids, they really connect with how eating good food makes you feel good and perform better in two hours. You know, so, you know, and, and we've had these conversations uh, having co-presenters with a sports organization could be the high school sports teams, the college sports team, the college coach. You know, those are very important advocates and, and bring them into your discussion, you know, if you have presentations. And of course, restaurants and farms. And I also just want to add, not on this list, but it's coming up more and more in, in some of our discussion, is with senior centers. There's a lot of, as the population gets older, there's a lot of interest about how to feed seniors and what they should eat um, and how they can cook if they live by themselves. And so those are great programs to consider. And then in your neighborhood, you can always ch contact your local chapters for Washington Farm to School Movement or any kind of, like, obviously we have people, uh, people on this call with us that's from outside the state, call the National Farm to School Network. And they would, um, and on their website, they have good links to what's happening farm to school in your community. And so those are really great places to start. Um, and then I like to move to the next slide, which is uh, uh, what are you know if you again we want to think about planning food programs in your at your at your library or schools. Um, these are these are very popular food related topics that's in discussion right now. Food waste is very much at the top of of conversations. You know, um, even in, in the in the chef world, how to how to about about thirty. You know, 
the statistics showed between 30 to 40 percent of our food is thrown away. So um, there's a lot of interest now in terms of how do we reduce that, how do we compose. Uh, and I uh, talked a little bit before about when we talk about food, it's not just about cooking and nutrition, but it's also about food traditions and food culture. And that, so if you, if you think about those topics, it's a great way to uh, reach out to a more diverse and inclusive community uh, and programming. Um, and so, uh, those are those are topics that everybody can be experts in their own experience, and so um, and then uh, we have, as you can see, other other discussion topic about sharing economy. Um, this goes back to food exchange, seed exchange, uh, those kind of topics, hunger, food security, as well as food justice. That's a topic that comes up a lot now, and we recently presented at a high school and. Children, they really kind of talk about social justice, but I was really impressed how high school students very quickly use the social justice topic and and uh, and then quickly focus specifically on food justice because that's something that they feel like they can get involved with and they can make a personal change um, in their own and uh, in, in their own living at home as well as in the community. Um, ongoing conversation about food labeling. Water, as uh, as Jeff points out, is you know, and what's going on in Flint, but also not just in Flint, but really, uh, as it turns out, throughout the country, you know, in terms of the lead that's like kind of passed out in the, in, the, in our water system is very much in people's interest. So those are all things that people can talk about: urban farming, sustainability, seed exchange, local chefs and farm. Um, and then finally, I just want to give some ideas of dates of promoting events. Uh, we just finished March, which is National uh, Nutrition Month. Um, and uh, we're, right now, we just started April National Gardening Month, so a uh, good time to t talk about, like, put out your gardening books or highlight your gardening, uh, uh, highlight your garden if you have one, or partner with local community uh, farms. Um, and also talk about biodiversity. Um, I'm also personally involved in this organization called Slow Food, which is part of the Slow Food International Network, but a very large Slow Food USA chapter. And uh, one thing Slow Food does is uh, promoting biodiversity, seeds that go away, that food that we don't grow it and we don't cook it, you know, it gets lost in, 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 the, in, the, in our food system. So in May, uh, it's the National Sports and Fitness Month, which is part of the uh, Michelle Obama's uh, Let's Move initiative. And so it's a great way, again, to talk about how food plays impact in terms of our health and fitness. Um, and then going to the, uh, the fall, uh, I mentioned September is Food Literacy Month, but it's also Organic Harvest Month, which nicely segue into October, which is National Farm to School Month. It's a terrific time to partner, again, with local, you know, uh, the school cafeteria program, farm to school program, and with your local farmers markets. And also specifically in October, October 24th is Food Day, which is an international um, celebration on, on local foods. And so these are dates to kind of keep in mind some sort of things you can do in your community. Um, and then um, finally, again, our, our food for thought is these are all ways to you know, think about better community through food. And I, we included this one slide. This is from a book that we published called A Moose Bush, which is a poetry book about food. Since this is, again, like April now is the poetry month, so we want to conclude with this thought. Poetry is food for your soul, and food is poetry for the tongue. And so read a delicious poem that makes your, your soul feel as young. And so I hope we can all share that. And thank you for your time. And we just have a few minutes, and we just well, want to open you. up that the was, questions for That was very informative, and I appreciate that. A good blend of, of, uh, of both library and publisher. Um, and I think food programs, just as I put them on, they're always very popular. So are there anyone have any questions? Go ahead and either, if you have a mic, you can click on your mic and talk, or you can type them in. So um, if you want to go ahead and do that, that'd be great. I'm not, let's see here. I'm not seeing. I think we, lots of folks that look, oh, it says, Melissa asked, what's the name of the food poetry book? It's called A Moose that? Bush. Like, um, it's a, t it's a the letter A. That? Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, of course. Go ahead and type it in yeah. chat. That would be great. 
Oh, I was excited you typed it in. I would have never gotten that. Right. It's, it's a fun takeoff on a views bush. Like the. Uh, okay, okay. I look right. I see that Ryan is typing something in. That should come through in just a moment. Any other questions or or comments? There's so much food poetry. Yes, there is. There's a ton of food poetry, both in the kids area and adults area. There's one thing I want to I mention real quick too is that um, um, the uh, connected to food as well as uh, alcohol program in programming, which has been kind of a, a interesting topic uh, with us. Uh, we have had a lot of interest in this, and homebrewing was one of the programs that we did. We didn't actually brew beer in the library because of <laughs> restrictions on that, but. Um, uh, we have had some success doing programs at off-site at places like wine bars for adults um, where we were able to include alcohol and some of the foundation programming where there was a, uh, a license and it was more of a, uh, uh, not just a, a, an open event where we would uh, have more difficulty with the permissions. Uh, as we're kind of moving forward, we're kind of looking at ways to incorporate more of those kind of opportunities to have um, alcohol in some of our programs for adults, but we haven't figured out the, the final answer on how to do that yet. But it, it has been, of course, you know, very, very popular when we're able to do it. Uh, but something I also want to add with the poetry. Sorry, um, uh, Melissa says. Um, uh, in fact, uh, at Readers to Eaters, we're hosting a kids' haiku food review contest. Um, there's a, a wonderful movie that just came out recently called City of Gold, and it's a documentary about Jonathan Gold uh, at the LA Times. He's the only food critic that won the Pulitzer Prize for writing food criticism. And it's a wonderful movie, and we were so inspired by it that we decided to sponsor a write a kids high school writing contest and asking kids to write book reviews either of their home of their home food or school food or restaurant food and send us. And so you can come to our Facebook page, and there's like additional information about that. Um, Melissa had mentioned that she has a poetry potluck lunch this month, which I think would be an interesting. Juxtaposition and Melissa, what, how are you doing the uh, poetry? How does that how does that work with the potluck? Could you kind of type a little bit about that? So um, while we're waiting for that, I wanted to again thank uh, Jeff and Philip for putting this together. It is it's always wonderful to have program ideas. We always like new ways to to learn more about attracting adults and making our libraries truly the heart of the community. And food is one way to do it combined with our very informative cookbooks. It's interesting to see how cookbooks have um, moved up and nudged medicine out of the way. It used to be that, that uh, medical books were the most uh, checked out nonfiction things. So OK, uh, she has had time, Melissa has had time to say we had our first poetry event called Poetry Jam. People could read their own poem or one by another poet. Okay, and so the, she's probably. And then there's a lot of traditional kids lit with food terms kids that might understand, and a great vocabulary expansion. And similarly, similar for the poetry potluck. Okay, any other questions mm -hmm. before we let um, say thank you to Carolyn? If I may, just also add this is Philip again. Um, I also want to just add, as I travel across the country, mm -hmm. I really do see a lot of really fun, creative things that libraries are doing as part of the as part of the food hub and as part of the food movement. And and one thing that I thought was uh, really terrific because in in Tucson, it's uh, uh, it's it's a little bit hot for the school to do to host a school garden to plant outside uh, a lot of times. So one thing they do is they start an aquaponic system. They are raising fish inside the school library, mm -hmm. and it's a, yeah, and it's a program that oh. is funded by the uh, I think it's called a community food bank, but it's really the South Arizona Food Bank, as asking libraries to grow proteins, you know, for their food banks, 
And so it was a, it was a, so it's an experiment. And I met the librarian, and you know, a few years actually back in 2013, because we published a book called Farmer Will Allen and the Growing Table about Will Allen, the urban farmer in Milwaukee, who is kind of my best known for doing a lot of aquaponics work. So she was so excited. She bought that book. And you know, because she said she's she's not a gardener, she certainly knew 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 nothing about aquaponics. And three years later, like actually, one of our authors just went to visit her library, and she says she's on a second generation of fish already. And um, and so it's really quite quite wow. amazing that she grows fish. The kids get to grow fish, and they you know give it to the food banks. Um. <laughs> that that is truly unique. I've never heard of anything like that. That is. You, you have to wonder how yeah, big well, yeah, the fish actually, tank I, is. In fact, I, maybe I'll forward some. I have some photos of the fish tank. It's really quite impressive. Um, and then, yeah, and I can't um, imagine. yeah, and and, and uh, certainly, uh, Jeff had mentioned about seed banks, but uh, I, I've seen many libraries also offer tool lending libraries as well, which is really helpful. Yes, mm -hmm. those are well. Uh, Thank you. And then we have someone recommending an, a book called Oatmail by Galloway Kinnell. Um, so anyway, I wanted to say thank you. And um, that's a poem. OK, that's good. And there will be an archive of, of this. Uh, normally, our archive is up um, by noon of the same day. So if anyone um, wanted to hear this, I they do can go back and go back to the first day so login individuals and get now. it. Yes, uh, daylight uh, uh, by noon Pacific daylight time. We are now on daylight time, not standard time. So it will be up by then. So again, thank you, everyone. Um, and we certainly appreciate it. And uh, it was interesting and fun. So thank you for your willingness you, to both attend and to thank present. Thank you. Sure, bye-bye. <laughs>